Coming up on Arirang News, Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors report a surge in net profit for the second quarter compared to a year earlier, having navigated the semiconductor shortage better than their rivals and thanks to strong SUV sales. The number two diplomats of South Korea and the U.S. meet in Seoul to discuss issues including North Korea. The U.S. envoy Wendy Sherman says she hopes to find a constructive way forward with the North. And the South Korean authorities extend the distancing rules in the greater Seoul area for another two weeks at the highest level. They'll announce details for other regions by Sunday. It's 5 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. South Korea's biggest automaker, Hyundai Motor, saw its earnings rise by 400 percent in the second quarter compared to a year earlier. Its affiliate, Kia, saw a big jump, too. Part of that, of course, was that sales the year before were so low in the early days of the pandemic, but also strong sales of their profitable SUV models. Min Soo Hyun reports. South Korea's Hyundai Motor has posted solid earnings for the second quarter of this year. The top automaker on Thursday reported a net profit of 1.7 billion U.S. dollars for the April to June period, seeing a whopping 400 percent on-year jump. The company's operating profit was $1.6 billion, the highest growth in seven years, while sales totaled $26 billion, up almost 39 percent on-year. The high gains were largely due to last year's low base effect due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as a strong demand for its high-margin SUV models and its premium Genesis cars. Compared to last year, Genesis sales were up more than three times in the U.S. This is probably because of its new redesigned vehicles that have high-quality features. And since consumers are not able to spend a lot on traveling amid the pandemic, many people are pouring their money into luxury goods like cars. The strong numbers were also backed by its supply chain management, which has helped the leading automaker amid a global chip shortage crisis. On Thursday, the company stressed that it's pursuing partnerships with major semiconductor companies to maintain stable supplies of auto chips. However, Hyundai expects on-year sales growth to slow in the second half of this year due to adverse business conditions, including rising raw material prices. Meanwhile, Hyundai's affiliate Kia also reported strong quarterly results. It saw an operating profit of $1.3 billion, while sales climbed more than 61 percent to over $15.6 billion. Hyundai and Kia, together the world's fifth largest car maker by sales, aim to sell about 7 million vehicles this year. Min Suk Hyun, Arirang News. And the honorary chairman of Hyundai Motor Group, Chung mong gu has become the first Korean to be inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame in Detroit in recognition of his contributions to the global auto industry. Chung joins the ranks of giants like Henry Ford, Thomas Edison and Carl Benz. The induction ceremony on Thursday was attended by the current chairman of Hyundai Motor Group, Chung yi Sun, on his father's behalf. Chung mong Gu's induction into the Automotive Hall of Fame was announced in February 2020, but the pandemic postponed his formal induction until this year. Market research by J.D. Power shows that South Korean home appliances are still the most popular in the United States. In its 2021 Appliance Satisfaction Survey, either Samsung Electronics and or LG Electronics were number one in every single category. Samsung topped nine of them, including washing machines and dryers, and LG two of them, including a refrigerator category. With that, Samsung has won more JD Power Awards for kitchen and laundry appliances than any other manufacturer. Time now for an in-depth look at the market news this afternoon, and for that I'm joined on the line by Mr. Daniel Yu, Global Strategist at Uanta Securities. Mr. Yu, good afternoon. Thanks for coming on today. Good afternoon. 
Well, on Wall Street overnight, all three main indices were up for a third session in a row, led by tech shares, while energy and financials were off. Uh, earnings coming through strong, though U.S. jobless claims were higher than expected. What's the story in the global markets? Yes, uh, even though the economic uh, number came through a little bit weaker than expected. Uh, the market did quite reasonably okay. Uh, however, though, uh, if you look at a small and mid-cap Russell 2000, it did fall continuously, and uh, that index is one of the worst performing index in the last two weeks. But in any case, uh, Dow was kind of flat. Uh, S&P was up by 0.2%, and NASDAQ was up by 0.36%. The initial jobless claim uh, unexpectedly actually rose uh, to a two-month high of 419,000 cases. Uh, uh, if uh, the estimation or expectation was uh, 350,000, uh, but it was much higher than expected. Uh, the reason for that is, is because of the Delta COVID uh, variant impact, we think. Um, and obviously that results into the labor market recovery to be much timid than uh, hoped uh, uh, in the past. Uh, overall, we are seeing uh, changes in the labor market and that we don't think that uh, it will be anytime soon to see uh, three, four percentage uh, unemployment ratios or a fully recovery of this jobless claim uh, level. Uh, we're not going to see that happening anytime soon. But uh, meanwhile, if you look at the sales of the uh, previously owned homes, uh, it rose for the uh, first time in the five months in June, which is clearly showing that the housing market is improving and the inventory is improving as well. So there's a mixed signals from uh, the U.S. market that there's a continuation of concern about the COVID-19 variant uh, impact. And at the same time, we are seeing uh, economic recovery actually happening quite nicely and smoothly. And um, everybody is saying that the U.S. handled this case of the d disease uh, much better than most of the other countries at the tours of uh, you know, recent uh, several months or so. Uh, all in all, though, uh, this COVID um, variant is most very highly uh, uh, infective, so therefore people are concerned about it, but nevertheless, the death rate is much lower than uh, the previous ones, so therefore uh, economic activity is not going to probably go down that much. Uh, all in all, U.S. market seems to be in a very sweet spot uh, with a reasonably low interest rate environment and inflationary worries dying down uh, and economic growth rate reasonably stable. Well, today, Korean stocks uh, closed higher, too. A nice gain uh, for certain companies like POSCO uh, after its big rise in earnings and also for Naver. Tell us about the domestic market. Yes, uh, Korean market uh, rose slightly up by 0.13% uh, for Kospi, and the Kostak was up by 0.5%. Uh, people are trying to understand exactly what the stance of BOK is. Uh, investors digesting comments from the uh, BOK governor, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, who noted that central bank is preparing to begin normalization of the pandemic era easing of monetary policy. Uh, but I think that people are also trying to figure out why would that be the case if the U.S. is not raising interest rate or doing any tapering. Um, and uh, the U.S. Fed is saying that the inflation is transitory. Uh, and Korea seems to be in a position where uh, we are seeing quite high cases of the new COVID-19 cases. Uh, on Friday, it seems that uh, numbers have hit the record high, and it has been continuously over 1,000 cases for 10 uh, consecutive days um, after the uh, greater Seoul uh, was placed uh, under the top social distancing measures. So uh, clearly it is indicating that this COVID Delta variant uh, is one of the most uh, infectious uh, respiratory disease we've ever seen, uh, and that's what exactly the scientists are all saying. Uh, 
Uh, all in all, that would have negative implication for domestic consumption. Uh, but uh, the global scale-wise, the export numbers and the corporate earnings are looking very good. Uh, and therefore, we think the valuation supports uh, the COSPI. Uh, in the short term, though, because of that uncertainty of COVID-19 Delta variant, uh, market might be in a, a box range. Uh, but uh, as the time passes, we think the Korean market can go up further based on valuation uh, and uh, earnings perspective. Well, now, we've talked about currencies a fair bit lately, and uh, the Korean won right now is trading at around 11.50 to the dollar. Uh, today, it peaked at around 11.53, uh, which was where it was uh, at its recent high uh, as the dollar strengthens. And we also see the U.S. 10-year uh, Treasury yield back up to almost 1.3%. Uh, so what do you see happening with uh, the exchange rate and Treasuries? Right. I think the most important factor is what's happened to dollar index. Uh, dollar index is at about 93 level right now. Uh, it's off the near four-month high of 93 plus. Uh, it seems to be a little bit stabilizing. Um, you know, with the inflation numbers coming through and the U.S. economy being as strong as what they have said, uh, people were thinking that the U.S. dollar might strengthen further. Uh, that would imp imply that the Korean won depreciate further, even it has hit the high end of the range of 1150. Uh, we don't think that will be happening. We think that the dollar index will stabilize as well as the Korean won should stabilize. The reason for that is because if you look at the debt uh, to GDP ratio of U.S., it is riding, rising rapidly and it is at around 106% and is expected to go up to 120 plus by the uh, sometime in 2023. Uh, if that's the case, that will be the highest level that we have seen uh, for um, U.S. economy, even higher than the 119 percent of the post uh, World War II era. So uh, with that kind of rising trend of the uh, government debt, and also uh, COVID variant is making an impact. Uh, and also the U.S. is highly uh, trade deficit country. So all being said, we don't think that tapering is happening anytime soon. We don't think that interest rate rising, uh, interest rate hike uh, from the Fed will be happening anytime soon either. So uh, we're probably not going to see uh, U.S. dollar uh, strengthening strongly until 2023. So we think that there will be at least another year and a half to two years of the room where the uh, U.S. dollar should be fairly stable in a range bound of 90 to 94 dollar uh, index. Uh, if that's the case, we think that the Korean won being at what it is of 1150, we think that that is probably the high end of the number uh, and it should be in the future range bound somewhere between 1100 to 1150. Uh, given the fact that Korean economy is going strong as well, and Korea's uh, debt to GDP ratio by the uh, government is one of the lowest at around 40 percent uh, or less. So uh, overall, we think that the one is not going to be continued to depreciate. Uh, if that's the case, then um, we think that the Korean equity market would have positive changes where foreign investors to start to buy again of Korea. And uh, finally, Mr. Yu, this week, uh, the ratings agency Fitch said it's keeping its rating for South Korea at AA minus, which is its fourth highest level, and its outlook is stable uh, next year. Also, Fitch is forecasting the economy to grow by 3%. Tell us about this outlook from Fitch. Right. Um, I think that, um, you know, the credit agency are looking at Korea as a very stable country. Uh, as you said, South Korea's credit rating is at AA minus with a stable outlook. Um, now, the, this is the fourth highest level of agency sovereign rating since 2012. Uh, Korea's rating balances, robust external finances, resilient mic uh, microeconomic performances, and modest fiscal headroom against geopolitical risk related to North Korea, and medium-term structural challenges from the aging population. That's what the comments are coming out. Uh, but uh, in any case, um, the economic growth is continued to be very strong, uh, even though there is uncertainty of this uh, COVID-19 cases, pandemic cases. Uh, and Korea has a very dynamic export sector, uh, particularly semiconductor and uh, 
the electric cars and battery industries and all the other uh, so-called traditional economic uh, sensitive uh, industries such as shipbuildings and uh, others. Uh, all in all, we think that the Korea is in a good position uh, to keep that kind of credit rating for now. Uh, only concern, though, is this uh, buildup of household debt. Uh, but it is well contained with the current uh, interest rate environment and also bank balance sheet seems to be fairly resilient and the vulnerability is not going to be that significant unless uh, Korea needs to raise the interest rate from current uh, level to say 2% plus to 3% and even 4%. Uh, uh, without that, we don't think that the, this current issue of con consumer debt is going to be the major, uh, major concern for the Korean economy. Got it. All right, Mr. Yu, we'll have to leave it there for today. Uh, thank you, as always, for sharing your insights with us. We appreciate it. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. The number two diplomats of South Korea and the United States met in Seoul today to discuss regional and global issues, including North Korea. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman says she expects to find a constructive way forward with the North while seeking cooperation with China on that issue. Yoon Jung-min reports. U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman says the U.S. is looking forward to a reliable, predictable and constructive way forward with North Korea. She was speaking to reporters on Friday after talks with her South Korean counterpart, Choi jong gun When asked about the issue of providing humanitarian aid to the North, Sherman added the U.S. all feels for the people of North Korea who are facing difficult circumstances due to the pandemic. Regarding China, the American diplomat said that the U.S. will continue to discuss regional challenges that undermine the rules-based international order. But she also said the North Korea issue is an area for cooperation with China, despite Washington's relationship with Beijing mostly being competitive. I have no doubt uh, that in my conversations in Tianjin in a few days uh, that uh, we will discuss the DPRK. Uh, China certainly has interests uh, and uh, thoughts, uh, and I will uh, share uh, what I hear with uh, the Republic of Korea and with Japan as part of our ongoing consultations. Seoul's Vice Foreign Minister Choi reaffirmed Seoul-Washington cooperation toward an early resumption of talks with the North, adding they are patiently waiting for a response by Pyongyang given the pandemic situation. He also stressed the importance of China's role in bringing the North back to the negotiating table. Regarding the Seoul-Washington-Tokyo alliance, the vice foreign minister reiterated the importance of trilateral cooperation. It's a platform that can play a leading role not just in Northeast Asia, but regarding the pandemic and global issues like climate change. The South Korea-U.S.-Japan platform has a long history. The ROK government has a very active stance on this platform. Choi and Sherman said the trilateral vice ministerial meeting will be held quarterly, and the next one will be in the fall, likely in Washington. The two diplomats also discussed follow-up measures from the Moon-Biden summit in May, including the vaccine partnership and supply chain issues. They also talked about the situation in Myanmar, cooperation with ASEAN, and climate change. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. The South Korean health authorities have decided to extend the highest level of distancing measures in the greater Seoul area for another two weeks. One change is that the ban on gatherings will also apply to sports, so they can't involve more than four people at a time. But weddings and funerals can be attended by people who are not relatives. Lee kyung -un has the details. After two weeks, under the strictest level of distancing in the capital region, the measures have been extended by another two weeks, starting next Monday. From July 26th until August 8th, the capital region will be under level 4 distancing measures for two weeks. Under level 4, the highest in the country's four-tier scheme, gatherings are limited to four people until 6 p.m. and only two people after 6 and restaurants and cafes must close by 10. There will be some new measures, too. 
The gathering rules will apply to sports, which previously have been exempt. So games cannot involve more than four people before 6 p.m. Also, staff at exhibitions and conferences have to get a PCR test, and visitors have to make a reservation in advance to attend. Weddings and funerals are limited to 49 people, but the previous rule on family and relatives only has been lifted. The decision to extend the rules comes as the capital region has seen no meaningful decline in cases. The daily average this week lowered than last week's only by 30 cases. And on Friday, the capital area alone had more than 1,000 cases, which put the nationwide total at over 1,600. The authorities attribute the lack of progress to the fast spread of the more transmissible Delta variant. It now accounts for more than 34 percent of the samples analyzed, a drastic jump from around 3 percent in late June. By extending the measures in the capital area, the government's goal is to bring the daily nationwide total to below 1,000. If we don't reach the desired goal in two weeks, we will consider imposing tougher restrictions on more facilities and on the operating hours of businesses. But that would also depend on how the situation unfolds in other regions, especially as summer hotspots where there's been an alarming surge. The authorities have decided to strengthen measures there too and will announce the details by Sunday. Lee kyung Arirang News. And with the distancing rules extended, this Sunday, President Moon Jae-in will be chairing a meeting of the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters. The Blue House said that Moon plans to review the nationwide pandemic response posture and the situation at local governments. This meeting is usually led by the Prime Minister and was last chaired by President Moon in December when the concern was the third wave. Sunday's meeting will link the president by video to the prime minister, the head of the KDCA, key cabinet members, as well as the mayors and governors of the cities of the country's 17 city and provincial administrations. Meanwhile, in line with the distancing rules, the Blue House Press Center will remain closed for another two weeks. People in their 50s in South Korea who want to get vaccinated in this round need to sign up by this Saturday at 6 p.m. The authorities say that more than 80 percent of this age group have done so, and the first shots will start on Monday. Also, for mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna, they're going to allow up to six weeks between the two doses instead of just three or four. Choi Won Jong reports. South Korea's vaccination drive for people in their 50s will accelerate in the coming weeks. According to health authorities on Friday, more than 80 percent of those eligible have made appointments. Breaking down further, since July 12, more than 84 percent of people between the ages of 55 and 59 have made reservations. For those 50 to 54, the rate is over 78 percent. For people in the older age group between 60 and 74, the corresponding rate is over 61 percent. Each rate will increase too, as the reservation deadline is this Saturday. People aged 55 to 59 will be the first group to get either Moderna's vaccine or Pfizer's from July 26. But those vaccinated in August will either get Moderna or Pfizer, depending on the vaccine supply at the time. The authorities will announce more detailed schedule for August during the last week of July. Starting next Monday, those who are getting the mRNA type of COVID-19 vaccine will get the second shot, four weeks after the first shot. The authorities decide to extend the waiting period from three weeks up to max of six. The vaccination interval was three weeks for Pfizer and four weeks for Moderna. But the vaccination authorities will allow people to complete inoculations within six weeks, depending on the vaccine supply situation, each medical center, and individual circumstances. Meanwhile, a South Korean military helicopter safely delivered more than 2,500 vaccine batches to a naval base on the island of Ulungdo on Friday. There are three types, 1,400 AstraZeneca, 360 Pfizer, and 800 Moderna. They are taken to the island's public health center. As of Friday, and with over 140,000 people, Having received vaccine shots, almost a third of South Korea's population have had at least one dose. 6.7 million people are fully vaccinated, or around 13 percent of the population. Cheon Jong, Arirang News.
And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.